Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Bartholomew uh, Bland. I'm the executive director of the Lehman College Art Gallery. Uh, and this is a part of our series on sound vision, harmonious relationships in art and music. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by the artist Lava Thomas, uh, who is represented by a wonderful sculptural work in the exhibition called A Change Is Gonna Come, uh, 2018. Uh, and we're going to be speaking with her about that today. Um, and thank you for joining me, Lava. It's nice to have you here. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Bartholomew. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, so we, we have been, before we started uh, recording, we've been talking about the state of the art world and the state of the museum world today. Um, and uh, uh, as, I, as we were talking about, Lehman has a BFA and an MFA program. Uh, and so uh, we always like to sort of talk a little bit about starting your artistic career. Um, and so before we start talking about your professional career, let's go back a little bit and talk about your sort of earliest aesthetic influences. What do you remember the most growing up in California um, uh, that, that came, that strikes your, in your memory? Um, well, I can't really, whoa, yes, yes, yes. I can speak it's to not. my earliest it's aesthetic not. influences. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I will talk a little bit about my earliest um, engagements with art. So um, growing up, my grandmother had a beauty shop and she um, subscribed to Highlights Magazine for Children. And it there was always an art section. There was a, uh, an image of an artwork and then a little bit of background about the artist. And one um, reproduction that I was really enthralled uh, by was Las Meninas by Velasquez. And it's the, it's the image of the Spanish princess in her gown and her ladies in waiting. And there was a dog in the oh, foreground. Terrible. Yes. And Velasquez painted himself in that um, painting. And around the same time, I was a flower girl in a wedding and had been fitted for this beautiful the most beautiful dress that I'd ever worn in my life up until that point. So I, I really connected with that image. And when I learned that Velasquez painted himself within, uh, into the painting, it helped me understand a bit about author, authorship and what artists can, could do. I was always a creative and bookish kid. I was the kid who was um, either playing the piano, reading, or drawing, and I had a facility for it, so I um, um, was encouraged to do that. I came from a creative family. So in terms of aesthetics, clothes were always important. I was raised in a creative family. I was raised in a church-going family. The Black church loomed large in my life growing up, and every Sunday was like a fashion show, and this was against the backdrop of Hollywood, Hollywood glamour, movies. Um, so this idea of uh, you dressing. In, you were growing up in Los Angeles. Yes, I, I am a native of Los Angeles, California. Yes, <laughs> I am deaf. I'm an LA girl, even though I live in the Bay Area. Um, so glamour, uh, aesthetics, my grandmother, beauty. My grandmother had a beauty shop. So um uh, making oneself uh, look beautiful, this idea of um, self-presentation and image, all of those things uh, were very influential to me. Um, another instance growing up, um, my family um, received the annual calendar from the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, which was the largest and oldest black insurance company um, in the United States, actually, and their headquarters was um, in West Adams in my great grandmother's neighborhood. So we would receive the calendar and uh, Charles White illustrated that calendar for a number of years. And the, the illustrations were just really beautiful, uh, beautiful charcoal drawings and portraits of black people that looked like members of my family that I could relate to. And the fact that, that they were drawings was um, another way that I could uh, see myself doing that because drawing was very 
um, foundational, not just in my training, but I was, I was a kid who drew essentially. And now your work today, when I was, you know, I, I looked at some of your work, it seemed to have two very distinct modes. Uh, and we'll tie the one, of course, which brought you uh, to this exhibition is your work with musical instruments, particularly the tambourine, mm -hmm. um, which we'll talk about. But I, I'm very interested in your figurative drawing because it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so beautiful. I curated a show a number of years ago with Phil Lavelle, who was, uh, you know, such a wonderful uh, technician in terms mm -hmm. of, of, of that kind of craftsmanship. And uh, tell me a little bit about how, because when you mentioned um, uh, seeing uh, Charles White's drawings, I mean, that is, I could see a, a line and continuum in, in, in that thread of your work. I um, was always taken by Charles White's work. Uh, Charles White's work and Elizabeth Catlett's work later. Um, she wasn't as popular or as well known um, when I think about my own um, art education or my exposure growing up. Um, it's, it's interesting that you talk about this this level of fine detail, that is just intrinsically a part of who I am and how I approach work. I remember in college, I wanted to do work that was much more uh, loose. And I even experimented a bit with um, abstraction, but it never felt right mm. to me. It, I was never, that was never a comfortable home for me. Um, when I think about the figure as well, and I think about figures of women, Elizabeth Catlett's work and her um, images of women uh, that portray their resilience, their strength, their care, in particular her, um, her portraits of uh, mothers, black mothers and their children, um, those works have had a, a, profound, a profound effect on me, a profound impact. Um, and you mentioned Velasquez. I mean, have you looked in terms of that kind of draftsmanship? Have you looked back to the old masters or neoclassicism? Uh, I mean, uh, I, I sort of come from a sort of more historical, like sort of people like Ang and and Ang Ang Ang. Yes, <laughs> Ang um, has played uh, a a huge part in my um, influences. It, what was interesting to me was that Aang wanted to be a history painter. Mm. And he considered portraits a lesser, um, a lesser genre and did portraits so that he could make money. What was fascinating- The, the pendulums are tossed off for the tourist trade. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The drawings were never treated uh, with as much seriousness or respect as his paintings were. So um, I think about Aang's work because the portraits now always have a biography that goes along with them. So there are no anonymous portraits in his body of work, you know, who because all of those portraits were commissioned by someone. And this idea of knowing who the person is, knowing something about them um, was always important to me as I approach uh, portraits of black women in particular. Who are these women? A lot of times, particularly when you have an image of a black person in art history, those are anonymous figures. We know nothing about them. We know nothing about their lives. We don't know their names. We, uh, because of course, they were not the ones who commissioned the paintings. They're often in these um, positions of um, servitude oftentimes, or uh, lesser status than the primary subject of the portrait, which is usually a white person. So I was, have always been very interested in giving uh, black people and black women in particular, um, the primary role as subject, and then not just representing their likeness, but offering um, biographical information to sort of flesh out the, um, the fullness of their humanity.
So we know this is a person who lived in this particular time and this is what they did. If in fact, I do have that information, this is who they were. Do you, I mean, and do you think that that is um, continuing on a line of, I mean, I always think, and I might be dating myself, sort of someone like Candy Wiley and moving those figures into overt historical sort of centerpieces. I mean, do you see yourself in that mode? Do you see that as something different? Or do you think that is sort of a, a broader, um, a broader goal of many African American art, contemporary artists working today. I, I don't think of well when you talk about portraiture in general and black black portraiture specifically. Um, Kahende Wiley is um, has reinvented or disrupted uh, the the genre of historical portraiture and historical painting. Um, I don't think of myself as someone who is in that particular lineage because while I'm dealing with archival images, I'm not dealing with the hi the history of European painting and and uh, you're not bringing in all of that overt historicism. No, I'm I'm not. I'm I'm not doing that. I'm using the archive to um, I'm using the archive to really reclaim some of these images and history, American history specifically, um, to really say something about our contribution and how black people have made uh, not just a contribution, how we have impacted the development of this country. Mm -hmm. So if there's a different, um, we have different projects, but when you talk about the larger genre of black portraiture, um, my work certainly falls in that. In that, uh, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I, we, I, I'm, jumping, <laughs> I'm jumping around a little bit here, but to go back to uh, your earliest, uh, your sort of earliest aesthetic memories, it's funny you talked about Highlight Magazine, because I remember as a child seeing Highlight Magazine and I never liked the font on the cover. <laughs> I know what you mean. Resist, I would resist it because I never liked the color combinations or the fonts. And I don't, right. I don't remember, I would always sort of just sort of push it away because of that. So it's interesting, those kind of You stuff. know, it was a very, um, a very sort of 60s yes. <laughs> aesthetic. I, and when you said that, I can see highlight, I can see the font, I can see the color blocks <laughs> yeah, absolutely. that are on the cover of the men. I devoured that magazine. Um, I I was also in the Book of the Month Club, so um, I would wait for my books because I'd always devour them as soon as I received them. And then Highlights Magazine, I was all I would always wait for that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, it sounds like so you grew up in a, a, a family that was encouraging of creative endeavors. Oh yes. Endeavors. Um, do you remember the moment you told your family you wanted to be an artist, or did you did that sort of? Uh, did, were you were you creating works? And what what was sort of where that you... was? You know, that was oh. never a real conversation. Um, in fact, um, I was never encouraged to be an artist per se, although I was always encouraged to be um, creative and received a lot of positive feedback um, for my talents. Um, mm. I didn't con really consider becoming a professional artist um, until I was well into college, even though I studied um, studio art. I, I was in the studio art program at UCLA and then later at CCAC. But I was also looking at professions that, um, that were sort of art adjacent. Um, when I was an undergrad at UCLA, I had an internship in the Antiquities Conservation Department at the Getty. Oh. And it was a wonderful experience. And it was a program that was designed uh, specifically to expose 
um, minority students in fine arts programs around the country, and not just fine arts programs, fine arts, art history programs around the country to different um, professions that the Getty offered. So of course there was there was um, art history, there were there were professions in art history, and I was in conservation. And I was seriously thinking about becoming um, a conservator and to going into that profession. It was a wonderful experience for me. And one of my tasks was making, um, making um, images of fourth and fifth century BC signet rings. So yeah. history was very alive <laughs> for me. I will say the idea of, even though you decided not to become a conservator, uh, I'm interested because I've worked with so many artists over the years who probably perhaps have not given enough thought to the materiality of their work and how it's going to age in ways. Uh, were, are, have you been conscious of that in your career? Does I'm always, you, uh, be, because of my experience in the conservation lab, um, conservation is always something that I think about. And as an artist who uh, works in uh, materials that can be quite vulnerable, paper, for example, and leather, the leather that's on the tambourines, because I always replace the drums of the tambourines. Um, I do think about that quite a bit. Um, thinking about conservation, there's there is one incident that really made me commit to becoming a, a fine artist. At the time that I was um, an intern in the conservation lab, which was in the Getty Villa, there was an exhibition by Carrie Mae Weems mm. that was just so um, powerful. And I, I'm forgetting the name of that work, but um, it was an exhibition of photographs of slaves and I, that, she, that she acquired from various archives. And I was just floored and I spent every day of my internship with that work. And I decided then that I wanted to create work that was, that aspired to be that powerful, that would impact the viewer um, in the way that those photographs impacted me. And so when I left the internship and returned to uh, campus that following fall, I was fully committed to, um, to continuing the path of an artist. And I, just left cons the thought of becoming a conserv conservator behind. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, and the Getty, I mean, I, I imagine as a young woman, the Getty is such a wonderful place to be and to uh, work in sort of physical. We were talking earlier about um, the museum is sort of a temple on the hill or on the mount or something. And the Getty is sort of the uh, 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 pinnacle of that, literally. Oh. That <laughs> You know, being an intern at the Getty was one of the most um, impactful and wonderful experiences of my education. Mm -hmm. And I was at the villa, which is in Malibu. And at the, okay. at the same time, this was before the, um, the Getty as we know it now was constructed, but there was a, um, a model of the, the, of the, the new Getty at the villa, and we took several trips to the construction site. The, the Getty is one of the most, the Getty Villa was one of the most beautiful, um, sublime. <laughs> that is the word, you know, the sublime. The sublime um, places. Sometimes it reminds me of what money can do, you know? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> ex exactly. Wow. And in addition to the setting being so amazing, and here, here I was a college student with this task of, um, another task of mine was to clean the marble sculptures with a Q-tip. <laughs> 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 that was that was that, and that, that killed off the conservation career. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, that was so arduous. We could only use uh, water. We couldn't use anything that would um, in any way harm the material. And it was during the summer and we were outside and it was very hot. And I remember thinking, no, this is not something that I'm signing up for. But making impressions and, and taking images of the um, ancient jewelry and then learning some of the history and just being in the conservation lab and with, uh, with a staff there that was so incredibly supportive. I mean, it, it, could, it would have been and a very easy, easy thing for me to have gone into the conservation field because I had a lot of support and the Getty is one of the, uh, their conservation lab and anything that the Getty does is just, you know, top notch, top. <laughs> So, so you went back to school after doing this internship, inspired by Carrie Mae Weems. I mean, was yes. that something you could have really committed to becoming a professional artist? Do you, I, I mean, do you sort of think about that as the moment in your life? That is the moment. That yeah. very much is the moment because here I was in an internship that was essentially designed for people like me to go into the conservation field. And all of those doors were opening for me. Mm -hmm. And then to stand in front of a piece of Carrie Mamie Weems work and just be floored mm. by it. I mean, that was the impact that I wanted to have in the world. That was the impact what that I that? aspired to have. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> but, of wonderful. Course, but of course, nobody does it like Carrie Mames. Nobody. But that is the definition. You don't want to be the second of anyone, do you? Sure, or, sure, you know, sure. Of your own style. Um, so moving forward a little bit, I, 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 when, how long did it take you from graduating from your academic studies to where you felt you were having some success as an artist? What was that? What was that period like uh, and how long was it? It has taken a very, very long time. And the reason, and, a, and sort of a circuitous route to do that. And the reason is because, um, you know, the, the myth of the starving artist, that was not ever something that I saw in my future. And even though I committed in college to take the path of, becoming an artist, um, it was more important to me to have some level of um, financial sustainability and to not rely on my artwork to do that. I, I also wanted a family. So I married, I had a child, another child eventually, and I saw to my life, I tended to my life in addition to tending to my art career. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say in, it has taken, literally it's taken decades, but it's because of the choices that I made. And I don't regret any of the choices that I've made because the truth is that um, even if you become a very successful artist out of the literally tens of thousands of people who aspire to be an artist, who go to art school, who um, receive an MFA, there are only a certain number of teaching jobs that are available. And even those teaching jobs, usually you're commuting from one college to another college to another college. So a tenure professorship in art is very, very rare. Um, even uh, getting a gallery is very difficult. And then the thought of, have, of being supported by either a very uh, sort of meager um, a salary as a teaching artist, mm -hmm. and then to be supported by collectors um, completely, that was not, you did not find this an attractive future. That, you were, that was yeah. not an attractive future to me. And I, I saw with a lot of my friends who received um, very early commission uh, recognition, with, you know, Whitney Biennial's right out of graduate school, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of times those careers weren't sustainable. It, it, at, watching, watching folks' careers 
they would have a good run for maybe five or 10 years, maybe. But then there's always someone coming up behind you. And it's really the only, I would say, top percent of all of us, top 1% of all of us in the profession that have a lasting legacy and eventually go into the canon. And even if you do enter the canon, there's no guarantee that 20 years, 30 years, that your name will still be recognized. So for me, it was very important to tend to my life that uh, in a way that would sustain me um, in the event that I didn't receive uh, profession, didn't have professional success, didn't receive any critical attention that I would have and it's not this idea of falling back on something. It was really um, thinking about what I wanted my life to look like holistically. So it's taken a very long time. I'm enjoying a level of success now that um, I didn't really um, envision for myself. I have work in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And that's been extremely um, gratifying for me. And then this year I received the purchase prize, a purchase prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And that was really wonderful. And over the years I've received um, several awards and my work is in the permanent collections of museums around the country. But it, it's, it's taken a long time and I will say this, I never stopped. I never you, stopped you, working. You got a bit older, you had more solid underpinnings to your career. Were you? Yeah, because I mean, I've seen your work. Um, uh, I mean, you're certainly one of the. If I go to art fairs, you know, you're sort of instantly recognizable as. But but also not a flavor of the month. You know, not a flavor of the. You know, you've been building I've been working, so long. Um, I've been working for. I've been working for decades. It's so funny because, you know, people think of this, you know, this idea of overnight success is really decades in the making. I mean, honestly, it really <laughs> is. And so if I had any advice to artists out there, it would be never stop working because you never know who's looking. You never know, especially now with social media, you never know who's looking. You never know what impact your work might have, not just on a lay viewership, but on other artists. I've been uh, impacted and influenced by um, artists that, that have really taught me how to look, not just look at the world in different ways or in specific ways, but, but have really shown me how to have a sustainable relationship with my own work. So never stop working, but don't put all of your eggs in one basket either. So the saying goes, I, I, I admire people who do that, but I've seen too many instance, instances of that happening because, and that artist just doesn't, all of the work, the commitment and the work could be good. The work can be stellar. The work can be so smart, but there are no guarantees in this field. Mm -hmm. And it is not a meritocracy. It, it definitely isn't. <laughs> well, it's also it, in many ways, it just seems very, I mean, I, having worked as a curator, you see so many artists particularly in middle age where that career has not happened for them and yes. what, what becomes of your range of options. And that's a very difficult thing for people to cope with, I think, um, I, you know. Um, uh, it's funny, you know, in talking so much uh, in the past year or two about uh, equity and inclusion in the art world, um, one of the things I think probably hasn't come to the fore as much as um, some other things is the age discrimination across the board, particularly for women, um, is a, a, I, I, think, I think a very, very um, powerful thing. Um, we've had, uh, I've had an idea for an exhibition for years on um, uh, pairing young emerging artists with artists who are in their, you know, senior artists. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the resistance to that uh, from foundations, from, uh, from grant sources, from artists themselves who do not want to be put into that category, you know, where their age is trying to be emphasized, I, it's really uh, astounding. Um, uh, the art world has always been youth oriented unless you, especially for women, especially, you can be a master yeah. and be a man. <laughs> yeah. I think, I like to hope that that's changing because that's, this is one of the last, especially when you talk about equity and inclusion, and especially when we're looking now at museums and art, museums and galleries that are more and more including work by artists of color, by black artists in particular, and by black women. Um, there is still very much a bias against middle age. It, it, there's this idea that if you haven't made it so, you know, if you haven't made it so yet, then, Not yet, very and much. then there are all of these um, uh, thematic exhibitions that, um, that really focus on youth, like there's, or awards under 30. I'm trying to remember of the name of Younger Than Jesus. That was another, you know, <laughs> you know, artists under 40, Younger Than Jesus, that would have been 30. There's, but th we live in a very youth oriented society. And there's and comes back a little bit in extreme old age where suddenly then you're 85 and you're revered, but there's a long yes. stretch between 40 and 80 where you're sort of exactly you're not, really, you're not the hot thing. And there. that's that's one of the reasons also why I say never stop working, because there's just there's going to be a time when there's not all of the attention because someone it's someone else's turn it's some someone else is the flavor of the month right yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if there can only, I, I guess society can only absorb so many people so as much right you know, right right right. So. right and that's just the reality of being an artist it really is it it is very real the age bias against women is very real um I just have to say that I've been, I've been incredibly uh, fortunate in that I have, I'm, bus I'm busier now than ever and I have a sustainable career and I'm not 30, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there, is there a point along the way? I mean, it's, you know, you've obviously had a, are having a wonderful and successful career. Is there something, I mean, it, it sounds very good that you didn't put your eggs in one basket. Is there something you had wished you had done differently or that you would, that you sort of felt like you made a tactical error along the way or, or have you been fairly, like you, uh, you've kept your ship steady in, in where it needs to go? Um, like I've, I mean, we all make mistakes. Yeah. You know, we all make, I, I we all make mistakes I would say I wish I had tended some of my relationships better. That yeah. is, yeah. I, and I wouldn't call it a regret. I would call it more uh, a lack of bandwidth, maybe. Yeah, well, <laughs> because they have to give, don't they? Yeah, yeah, lack of bandwidth. Um, there, there. I wish that I tended my relationships better. There are a couple of instances where. Um, you know, afterwards I'll say, oh, I shouldn't have said that, or, you know, it's this sort of, you know, after the fact self-censoring, but no real, no real, uh, regrets. There isn't anything, um, that I can point to in my past and say, oh, you know, I should have really, mm. <laughs> no, could have, yes. really, really could have, should you know, as I said, I'm, um, I'm, enjoying a level of uh, recognition and attention now that I really, you know, as, as I was uh, making work in my studio with, you know, not too many people looking at the work, you know, I didn't imagine that um, I'd have the career that I have now. Of course, I hoped for it, but that was never my um, my real motivation. I was compelled to make the work no matter what. Well, it's funny from, you know, visiting hundreds of artists' studios, 
I can never tell who's going to be, you know, a, a blazing success. Right. But I always tell the people who are going to do, it's the people who have to be in the studio. They yes. don't have to be on the scene in Brooklyn. They don't have to be cool. They don't, it's the people who just are driven by some um, force propulsive into the studio to make something every day. That the people who will get some kind of satisfaction in their life, I think, from that uh, from that work, uh, and you recognize if, it in people. If uh, I'm not in the studio, I'm not happy. It, it's as simple as that. I mean, making art, even when I didn't know exactly what I was doing, like gr like I said, growing up, I was that kid who was reading. I was that kid who was playing the piano. Foremost, I was that kid who was drawing. That's wonderful. That's yeah. Wonderful. Uh, we've used up most of our interview time, but I'd like to bring back to the last question, coming back to the theme of sound vision and music. And uh, perhaps you could speak a little bit about, specifically about uh, the piece that's in the exhibition, uh, A Change is Gonna Come, and also the use of musical instruments in your work, because that of course uh, is uh, what brought me to you and um, I, has made me aware of your work for some time. So I'd love to know a little bit about, about that motivation. Um, you know, I grew, like I said, I grew up in a black church. So playing the tambourine for me was um, an ecstatic experience, just congregational singing, um, playing the tambourine, being, being at one with my community um in song was is still one of the fondest memories that I have of my childhood and I grew up in a musical family my grandmother my great-grandmother my aunt um were all uh, church musicians pianists organs choir directors uh, my what mother pardon me what denomination Oh, Baptist and Baptist and Pentecostal. Oh, interesting. So my grandmother was part of the Pentecostal church. The rest of my family were Baptists. And that's an interesting story. <laughs> that's another story. Beyond the in parameters fact, of the interview. You know, now I'm in a large group exhibition at Bridgepoint Projects um, in Los Angeles that visualizes the impact of um, the Pentecostal denomination on artists and opened on the anniversary of the um, April 9th, Azusa, 1906 Azusa revival, which was the genesis of Pentecostalism. And it's a wonderful group exhibition with a lot of amazing artists and a lot of um, music emphasized in that exhibition. So um, I, I grew up in a musical family. There was always um, music played in my home. And my, grand, my, my mother was a jazz aficion, aficionado. <laughs> she loved jazz and frequented um, the jazz clubs in Los Angeles. And at the time of my mother's youth, uh, jazz in Los Angeles was a very big thing. And I had an uncle who didn't play um, sax professionally, but would have jazz, my mother would have jazz sessions when I was a young girl. And it was, it was an interesting thing because um, it was considered devil music by my grandmother and by my great grandmother. So there was always this sense of conflict around what was acceptable music to listen to. And my mother having grown up in the church was very rebellious. So um, the music was very important in my life. Um, all of the women as girls took piano lessons. Um, the tambourine was very important in my experience with it. And I started experience, experimenting with the tambourine um, as material in 2012. And I was preparing for a solo exhibition at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco that was to open the following year in 2013. And in the galleries, there was a small room um, that was just perfect for 
um, and installation. And it was a survey of my work, um, older work, and then new work. And I was determined that I would make an installation. And since the topic of that show was really about the women in my family, uh, my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, um, I envisioned, so that's the best way to say it. I envisioned the room um, being full of hanging tambourines. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I used tambourines in my work and have cont I've continued to use the tambourine in various forms, uh, hanging installations. Um, I have a large installation that's now um, at Tall Arts Hotel in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. that's comprised of 700 hanging pink tambourines. <laughs> um, I've uh, created several wall pieces. Um, the piece that's in the Smithsonian American Art Museum's permanent collection, the title of that is Requiem for Charleston, and it's a wall installation of uh, tambourines that are covered with black lambskin that memorialize the nine women and men who were killed uh, when a white supremacist murdered um, men and women during a Bible study in the summer of 2015. And that piece has their names written in pyrographic calligraphy, which is um, done using a wood burning tool that's used primarily in Americana craft. So the piece that you have, a change is going to come, or change is gonna come, is titled after a Sam Cooke song, change is gonna come. Okay. And it's made of blue tambourines with the title of the song on it. And I was thinking of um, R&B music of the civil rights mu uh, movement, um, songs that have become anthems. And I created that piece during the time when Trump was in office and then looking forward to um, the next election. So um, that is, the, <laughs> yeah, like looking, looking to a change and hoping for a change. So that's the genesis of the piece that's in um, the it's show at Lehman now. right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I have one more question about uh, the iconography of the eye, because I know in at least one of your tambourine pieces, the eye appears uh, over and over again. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the significance of that, because I was, I was interested in those. You things. know, I started using that, um, the eye on tambourines in a solo exhibition that I had in 2015 where, um, at Berkeley Art Center, where um, I had two large scale six foot portraits of women ancestors that were based on uh, family photographs from my grandmother's photo album. Mm. So the tambourines actually have um, the eyes that are from those women on them. And I see that as a way of, especially with that complete installation, like with that installation, the portraits are very large. I've activated the eyes by uh, coloring them realistically. So the drawings themselves are black and white. And then you have these eyes that are alive and activated that are looking at you. So the idea of that whole piece, uh, the name of the installation is looking back and seeing now. And there's this play on looking, looking back at the past, what has changed, what remains the same, what obstacles um, did my ancestor women have to uh, live through as black women from the South migrating to Los Angeles? What kinds of um, obstacles, dangers, traumas do we as black people still experience today? What's the same, but also who's watching? Like I feel very much the presence of my ancestors. And in that piece in particular, it's as if with those eyes, you're being watched. The tambourines also have mirrors on them so you can see yourself. So there's also this idea of um, reflection, reflection on the past, reflecting on the present, seeing your own reflection. 
looking, viewing this piece, but having the piece also look back at you. Wonderful. So it's a, la it's a very layered piece. <laughs> very, very layered, uh, yeah. very layered piece. Well, I think that's a perfect place to stop, Lava. It's, uh, your work is wonderful. It's uh, an honor to have you in the exhibition. I'm, I'm so pleased. Uh, and I hope that I get to meet you in real life uh, in the not too distant future. That would be a, a wonderful. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today, to talk to our students and our, our uh, audience. And we're really appreciative. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me, Bartholomew. It's, it's been a lot of fun. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.